everyone and welcome to our very special conversation today with violinist Raged Wedwell. Also joining me is my colleague Dr. Patricio Molina who is the director of the Conservatory of the Newark School of the Arts and I'm Nadine Herman, artistic director of the Newark School of the Arts. So Raged, hello and welcome and thank you so much for being here with us today. Hello from Norway. It's evening Yay. here and it's lunch over there in New York, right? Exactly, but it, it's pretty dark over there in Norway now, right? It's dark now, yes. Well, anyway, I know many people know you, Roggen, but just in case they do not, let me tell them something about your incredible career. Roggen Wentworth is known for her expressive playing and beautiful tones. Roggen began playing at 11 years old and went on to study with legendary violinists Nathan Milstein and Aaron Roseanne. She has appeared in major concert halls all over Europe and the US. Orchestra engagements have included the Royal Philharmonic, Norway, Oslo, and Bergen Philharmonic, plus appearances as guest artists at many festivals, including Bergen and Janacek Festival. She has recorded with the Royal Philharmonic for Philips, Center. Verese International, and appears frequently on Scandinavian TV and on radio, plus appearances on the BBC, WQXR, and WFMT. Renaissance artist Ragen embodies the personal concept of musician, visual artist, and creator of various new concepts. Her vision has always been one of musician, visual artist, steeped in colors, which come together in her multimedia show, Image in My Music. Roggen has always seen the music that she has performed in colors, shapes, and images, which she brings to the audiences on her 1689 Stradivarius, with video projections behind her combined with her own artwork. Whether Roggen appears in recitals, masterclass, or with orchestras, she continues to captivate audiences all over the world. So Roggen, welcome, and I am so thrilled that you can be here today. Thank you. Well, I want to begin by asking you question, a question about two people that I have admired most of my life, and that is the violinist Nathan Milstein and Aaron Roseanne, who I had the opportunity to watch, teach, and know one summer at the Nice Conservatory, where I was teaching also. So I wanted to ask you, what was it like studying with these two legends? Well, first of all, Nathan Milstein uh, refused to be called a teacher. He said he does not teach. And maybe I should just describe an afternoon with him because it wasn't like a lesson or a 45 minute session or anything like that. Um, it would be, you would simply bring your violin. You wouldn't know what to play or anything but you would come say it, uh, he would ask you to come at two o'clock to his um, place at 17 Chester Square in London. And um, uh, you would come in and then uh, pick up your violin and stuff. And he would sit by the piano and the piano was full of uh, all these amazing historic, you know, to me, historic photographs of himself with all the greats of, of his, of, of his, uh, that he, he had been working with uh, and friends with all his life. And he would sit there at his piano and uh, violin in hand or not, he would put it away and then he would doodle on the piano and say, what do you think of this? And he was working on um, uh, his own arrangements and he would try them out and he would always try them out on the piano first and then I'd try them on the violin and then after a while of back and forth and what do you think and how does that sound and things and then he said oh play me something mm -hmm. uh yeah how about paganini caprice number how about 24 <laughs> no no everybody plays 24 uh play me something else 
And then he would think of something else. And finally he would, you know, uh, say, oh, how about number five? And so you'd have to be ready to play anything then. Right, uh, exactly. And, and then uh, we'll play me a concerto. Oh, no, I'm tired of, of, no, not that concerto. Play me the Mendelssohn or something. And um, you'd have to be ready to play anything at all. But, and then he would talk about what interested him. And then he would talk about, um, you know, he had this amazing brain. Talk about chess players, you know, they think many, many moves ahead. And he would think, he could think much faster than that because he would think uh, many, many, many phrases ahead in his head. And he would um, make up fingerings and you know, you only have four fingers and four strings and um, fast passage work. And he would make it up always new, always something new. He would always experiment what works better? What's most effective? That was, was, was effective what was a word that he used a lot. And um, uh, so he would make up, even in concert, he would make up his fingerings in the fastest passage work. And I mean, thinking so fast ahead that you have enough fingers that it works out. It's just like, I don't know anyone else who can do that. Wow. Um, and, and he would talk very much about architecture and, uh, you know, Bach, he'd play a lot of Bach. And then uh, he would talk about, uh, you know, how the bass line would go and separate from everything else and how it was all um, put together. And that's why he was such a master at um, architecture and mm -hmm. seeing the whole um, you know, the f whole first page in the violin, in the violin music, the whole first page is just one long phrase. And um, uh, he, he wouldn't dwell, he wouldn't, you know, dwell too much on portamenti and things like that um, at the expense of the long line. So that was really, his, uh, he was such an aristocrat. And so then, you know, be like, as you can imagine, you, you never knew what you were going to play. So after a session of several hours, 5 p.m., um, his wife would come in and say, oh, it's tea time. And then wow. he was set up downstairs and you would go downstairs and have tea and um, with his wife. And then it was all like, would you like some extra water? Is this too strong for you? Or would you like lemon? What would you like with it and things? And then freshly made, you know, cakes and everything. And then as you sat there on the sofa, there was this wall where he had um, his paintings. He painted um, mm -hmm. watercolors and things of beautiful landscapes. And um, so I felt right at home. And then after, after tea, it was back upstairs and doing the same thing whatever in music. And then finally, when I left, it was, I felt like I could fly because wow. it just seemed so easy to play the violin. <laughs> wow. Well, what, what inspiration. wow. Yeah, it was really inspiring. Now, the, I, uh, you're talking about this, this world of the, like the Renaissance period, you know, it's very unusual to find people like that today because we're, we're so, um, you know, uh, specific to a very detailed craft exactly. um, but there's something about learning from different types of arts and different activities that influence you know in just in just a, the a few minutes that I got to know you um, you you spoke about chest architecture painting food you know how, how do how do all of these different activities um, you know, create you as this, you know, I, I, and I see that behind you on the, on your right. And I, I want to ask you about that. Uh, you also have a painting. So how, yeah. how, you know, that you create it. So yes, can you tell I us am... about, about, a little bit about how do these different activities inspire each other? Oh, well, I, I, to me, that's, that's who I am. That's how I am. So I am an artist and I express myself in different art forms. And um, 
it's just like walking out of um, Mr. Mostein's home after a, a full day of, of being inspired with, with music and art. It's when I paint, like I painted, this is one of my la latest opus. It's called The Back. Um, um, you can see it's a bit perspective, how do you call that? Perspectivistic? Now, is that a word? <laughs> so <laughs> you see a little bit from above, right? So the perspective is like, is like, like that. And so that's makes makes the back kind of like ho ho. So um, yeah, that inspires me, and then it's more fun to practice. So yeah. to me, to me, that goes together. Um, it, it always has. I mean, I painted before I touched an instrument. Well, I I didn't know that about you, Rogan. Well, the other thing is uh, about Mr. Roseanne sitting in his class. He mm -hmm. inspired me so much as a singer because with him, it was, correct me if I'm wrong, it was always about bringing out this beautiful musical line. Mm -hmm. I, I've never met so, someone so musical in my entire life. And I used to think, wow, I wish I could sing a line the way he played the violin because it just, it was just incredibly beautiful. The other thing I remembered, correct me if I'm right about that, he always had a cigar. Oh, Am yes. Right? You know, and Cristo number two, I have to tell you a story about that because <laughs> I mean, the way I met him was I played at the Bergen Festival. I played at a masterclass that he had there when I was 15 or 16. And after that, he invited me to Italy to study with him. Mm -hmm. And um, I took the train alone and it was in the train. I say train because it was the plane, but the, of course there was strike because this is Italy. So right. I had to take the train and being 16, it was like, um, I mean, how often do you send 16 year olds alone around the world nowadays? Mm -hmm. And then finally I found Vill Villaggio en la Deza, which is where he had his um, place, which wasn't too far from Nice. And um, uh, what was I talking about? Uh, well, studying with Ms. Rosad and the cigar. Oh yes, I was completely off topic now because um, uh, I remember, so I became part of the family. He didn't have many students. That, that was just the, he just started teaching at that time. Mm -hmm. And after that, he brought me to the US and that's how I came to the United States uh -huh. and um, to study the first time. And, uh, you know, I would always stay with the family and everything. And so the next time I was coming from Norway to, to New York, he instructed me and I know nothing. I'm mean, imagine being, you know, in your late teens and well, especially me, I was really naive. So he said, he instructed me and said, you know, and uh, go to such and such a store in Oslo and buy me cigars and they're called Monte Cristo number two and take them out of the wrapping, take them out of the box and put them in, you know, plastic bags and stuff in your, in your underwear and your suitcase. And so I did that and I brought it to him. And of course I wasn't stopped or anything because who stops a girl like that? Exactly. And so I brought him them. That's why I know so well, it's Monte Cristo number two. <laughs> well I wanted to ask you, since you did spend a lot of time in New York playing, as an artist, how do you compare the artistic life pre-pandemic in Norway, Norway as compared to New York? And what's it like over there now for an artist? Well, I mean, it's, it's like it is everywhere, everywhere else. It's, I mean, you, if you can't perform, you know, it's, it's uh, non-existent. People get creative. They uh, have performances online and things. And um, I mean, it's the same, whether it's New York or Norway, you have to do, do the same precautions, safety mm -hmm. precautions and everything. So um, distance and, and everything. So, so right now it's, it's, 
I mean, occasionally people, there are concerts, you have, you know, a fraction of the audience you have, maybe when you have 2000, you have 200 in the audience and things mm -hmm. like that. And, uh, yeah, my daughter plays in the opera orchestra in Oslo and she said that, um, yeah, they have occasional, then they arrange their, you know, uh, thank God it's at least they have performances as opposed to the right. Metropolitan Opera. I mean, that's, I, yeah, I shudder to think about that, but they, she, she was describing how, you know, when they have their performances, it's kind of pathetic, like, it right. sounds like that, the, you know, the clapping, it's, yeah, we well, have to, for better times. Yeah. So, uh, Ryan, uh, you know, for the 32 years I have been studying music all my life, I, uh, you know, we studied in school, all of these people that have synesthesia, uh, you know, I can think of uh, uh, Scriabin, for example, uh, and a lot of, uh, uh, so there's this, this story that we, we always tell, but I never met a musician that actually could say that some uh, colors with the sounds of music. So can you tell us about that a little bit? Well, actually, I wasn't aware of that there is a name for it. I thought everybody was like that. And um, I even taught students and said, what color is this concerto? And they would go, hmm, beige -ish. And I said, yes. But I, afterwards, I learned that, you know, it's completely individual. There is, is no rhyme or reason to it. And it's not like an absolute or anything. Everybody sees something else who is synesthetic. Hmm. And I've I've uh, learned of many people who are now that I've been aware of it. So, and if there are many more people who aren't really aware, like I wasn't, then who knows how many people really experience, you know, it's, it's really, a cro your senses are, are uh, crossing with each other, they're, they're meshing, right? They're mingling. So, so it's, um, an, an, an auditory experience also becomes a visual experience automatically, involuntarily. Yeah. Now, do you experience that, like sitting in, in a concert hall? Are you listening to the sounds with colors? Do they come immediately, or is it like a oh, yeah. overall color for the whole piece? The, the whole piece is, is generally an overall color, hmm. and, uh, and then the details are are you know, if a flute comes with a high, with a high uh, blip, it, it'll be like a, a light yellow flash or something like that. And if you listen to the same piece, the same symphony twice, would you see the same colors? Always. Always. That's what? That I've, you know, I read about it afterwards, so now I can confirm that if you have synesthesia, it'll always be the same with your brain it'll always be experienced the same it will never change in your lifetime amazing wow well and i also wanted to ask you about your show uh how do you pick the pieces that you play what what determines like a, a, a image in my music how did you make decide on the selection was it from the colors that you saw ahead of time or was it something that you've always wanted to play? Or did it go with a specific mood or theme that you wanted to portray? Actually, not the last, but the other two. It's very mm -hmm. interesting how you have a different, you know, you, you I, I never thought of asking that way because I never thought of it that way. So let me tell you how it came about for me, because for me playing concerts, I always thought that, um, I wish I could have, because I'm standing here on stage in my bubble in this beautiful green bubble right now because this piece is this color and nobody can see it because only I see it. I mean, they can't see what I see. And I always dreamt about making a, a concert where the whole experience becomes the same for everybody so that people in the audience don't just see some person playing the violin and... Uh, some boring ceiling light or something, spotlight, whatever. And, but technology wasn't there. So it's only a few years ago that I made this show where I finally 
could integ integrate what, what I saw so that the audience could see what I see. And I was standing in the middle of my own um, inner world, if you understand what I mean. Yeah. And um, uh, so um, I can explain to you how I did that, but to answer your other questions, I wanted to make, I chose the pieces for two different reasons. One was I wanted to make it a varied experience for the audience. Um, I wanted it to make a one hour concert and not with an intermission because I didn't want people to, to I wanted people to stay up there and then it was finished rather than up, pause, and then up yeah. again and then go home. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted it to be just one experience and then you can go home, you can go eat. And um, the other thing I was thinking is that I wanted to make it available for a, a wider audience. I hope that, that that it wasn't as easy as I thought because pe once I did have the show, it's mostly still classical music, my same yeah. audience that's coming. I was hoping, you know, it would be um, uh, people from, you know, interested in different kinds of music. Um, I'm still hoping that that's possible, but I chose the pieces. I chose mostly short pieces for that reason. Yep. So three, four, five minutes. I wanted to have one bigger piece because so as not to offend my classical audience, <laughs> right? So, um, and the other, the that was one. And the other was that I um, wanted to pick pieces that were different colors. <laughs> so um, I started with a Handel Larghetto, which is really, really sad. Oh, you've seen it maybe. Yes, I, I watched yeah. the show the other so night, So it yeah. starts with this really, really sad because I, I, I thought, okay, I'll do something different. I'll start from, you know, nothing and it's dark and then it starts very, very simple and very sad. And to me, that was a piece that's about a mother who's lost her baby, her child. And this was before, um, before many of the tragedies that we've had lately. Yeah. So, um, of losing children and so forth. And then I had, um, I scheduled a, and, and that was, uh, the colors there were, you know, starting dark and by the ocean and, um, sort of very still and very rolling waves in the tempo that the larghetto was. And then <clears throat> I continued with the only larger piece, which is the poem by Chausson. And um, the ironic thing is that, uh, and that would go on, you know, that that is a mostly green piece. <laughs> So the feeling of it is, is mostly green and sort of washed out. And it's interesting because, um, you know, the Chanson is, is a mix of, of uh, romantic and, and heading into um, um, uh, oh, I can't think of the word now that, you know, more. Um, well, I would say, would you say early impressionistic? Yes, exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. I guess, yeah, it's impressionistic. And, um, and so, you know, so they even, even the visually, it was more sort of washed out and impressionistic. Mm -hmm. And um, to me, the piece had always been taking place in France, and I knew nothing about it. And I have to tell you, I read something afterwards, which was really, really interesting, because um, to me, it was about a um, uh, love triangle and him and her and the other one and um, conversations and drama and incredible romantic love and, and yearning and, and a climax and everything. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, what a fascinating. You know, the, the, the whole world of, you know, uh, programming and the color. Uh, 
I, I feel like we could do a whole interview just asking you about um, uh, about the synesthesia and the, the, the programming. It's just a fascinating, fascinating world. <laughs> so Ryan, I'm, I'm uh, curious um, if you can share your thoughts about what are some of the opportunities that musicians have you know, with new technology and, and the future, what, what are some of the, the opportunities that we have as musicians? Well, we certainly have very different opportunities than before. I mean, and it's changing all the time and has been changing all the time. I remember Nathan Milstein was telling me to do it just the way he had done it. That was all he knew which was, oh, just have a recital in New York, have one in London and one in Paris, then right. you'll get an agent and he'll get you concerts all over the world. That's not how it works. It work anyway. It didn't network. work like that in my day and it doesn't work, certainly doesn't work like that today. And so while young people have very many opportunities because technology makes it so easily available, it's also um, much harder. There are, I mean, there are so many of them now and they are so good. Right. It, it, the, the, the level in Norway, the level is incredible. So many good people and they do so much good stuff. Mm -hmm. It's, and, and of course they have technology available in a very different way than, than we did. Um, but they will have to, and, and they have also, especially in Norway, they have many more opportunities. There is so much in place now of organizations that help young people and so forth that, that weren't there when I was young. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's, all, it's, it's ever changing. And now of course, everybody's forced to be really creative and, and think of new ways to use their music. I feel lucky that I have, I have visual arts and other things that I can do while I mm -hmm. don't do concerts because I, I'm, I don't know how, it must be incredibly frustrating. I'm not frustrated for not playing mm -hmm. concerts because I am actually, I had always planned to paint more. Yeah older days so I'm fine but but and and I I hear about so many people being so frustrated and I can only imagine I I, I do not envy people who depend on playing concerts for a living right now yeah it, it's extremely difficult to them uh, and that was the other question I wanted to ask you and I know that our parents would be interested in this you having a gifted daughter like Victoria I mean, the last time I saw her, she was at pre-college Manhattan School of Music. Oh, yeah. That's wow. So what advice do you have for parents who have a gifted child like you had? Uh, and right now about, I mean, because since everything is online, what type of encouragement do you give parents who are raising gifted children? And it's really, really difficult right now as far as lessons and practicing and the whole nine yards. I don't know that my advice is, 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 is worth more than anyone else's, but you know, music and the arts is, is, um, is food for the soul, whether you do it for yourself at home or for someone else or for a larger audience. And um, I mean, I, I taught, I also taught online. For me, it was really frustrating. It was, because you can't physically show, you can't, yeah. you know, uh, there are many things you can't do and the sound quality and so forth. So, um, uh, but I would say stick with it, you know, because it's like in the old days when there was no television and no, uh, no nothing, people had a piano in their living room and their entertainment yeah. was making music. So, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. I said, that's how I grew up. Yeah, yeah. And, but, I mean, it's interesting how you get back to, imagine if we didn't have Zoom right now and we couldn't communicate like this. 
all we would have is our piano at home. And um, even when I press let me see if I can show you. There, that's, uh, I have. Uh, <laughs> and here's my violin, is it? Uh, you voila, your Stradivarius. Well, wow. actually, uh, it's not my, that one is on my Stradivarius, <laughs> but, um, yeah, advice to parents. I, I I really don't have very good advice because the the the, the one sure thing is that you, a simple instrument like a violin is something you can carry around and you can do in the living room or in your bedroom, and mm -hmm. you can have a lesson in your bedroom or in the kitchen, and um, um, whether you do it for enjoyment or you for for professional later on. It's, you know, that's one thing I have to tell you that, you know, with all my kids, they played music, not because um, there, were, there was no telling whether anyone chose to become a musician, that wasn't the objective, but simply to me, it's part of a good education. Yeah, mm -hmm. one of the most important parts. Yeah. Rogan, it was so great to see you today. Great to uh, see you too. I hope I hope when this is over, you'll be coming to New York, so I, we can. I hope intend you. to. One of yeah. you know two two of, uh, two of my children are in Seattle. Yeah. And even the time difference makes it hard to to. I mean, we can only be in touch from this time on for a few hours until I go to sleep. Yeah. And then when I get up in the morning is when they go to when they go to sleep. That's when we can communicate. We don't have yeah. all day. <laughs> you know, it's really, really difficult right now. And I just hope that when this is all over, uh, that we can all get our lives back and be out there meeting and greeting <clears throat> and performing. And yeah. you know, whether we make music in someone's apartment or on a stage or wherever that we're all together doing it. So yes. uh, thank you so much for being with us today. And I'm sure Dr. Molina would like to thank you also. Patricio, are you there? Ryan, it was a very, very nice meeting you. I, I love uh, hearing your stories. You know, you mentioned how, uh, you know, the, your teacher did not consider himself a teacher. And I no. love that we end the interview with you saying, I don't know if I can give advice, but I think you know, I think that the best advice and the best teachers are the ones that motivate their students with their own lives. And you're such a, you know, renaissance person in this world that all that you do is just a, a motivation for the students and for the people that are around you. So that's the best. Oh, that, thing, I believe. That's very flattering. I, I hope so. I don't know. <laughs> Well, well Rod, we you. have to go now, but I want to thank you so much. And as I say to everyone, see you soon. And that's a promise. Yes, let's promise. <laughs> see you soon. Bye -bye. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.